podcast of the movement of the Peace of Unity. Our movement, the MPU, was founded by Marxist Leninists in mid-July 2017, with the goal of creating an international community to spread the ideology of Marxist Leninist thought at a community level. The MPU is a predominantly Marxist Leninist group, and the MPU contains members from various tendencies of Marxist thought. Our intent is to create a world movement against worker exploitation, imperialism, and autocracy via fostering Marxist Leninist ideology with the ultimate goal of spreading socialist democracy worldwide. All right, this is your host Jack and my co host Koba. Hello there. Joined by Rojo. What's up? Power. Hey, hello. Suzaku. Good topic. And we're going to go right on to our first topic, which is defining Marxist Leninist socialism, which is fairly important given. Uh, that's our whole thing. I'm going to pass it right off to uh, power. Socialism is a basic political ideology founded on creating a world for workers, and it's founded on three principles. The first one is that the working class control social relations and economic relations. The second one is the public ownership of the means of production, or otherwise the abolition of private property. Not private property in the sense that, like your house, your car, but... Anything that can produce labor power. And the third one, which I'm not sure if this is a new and adapted principle, but it's economic planning and seen as a necessity for socialism. All right. Uh, I think we should start off by uh, really making the distinction between uh, private property and personal property. Because conservatives love to say that oh, they're coming for your uh, your toothbrush and you're, uh, you're going to have to share and you're not going to be able to own a house or a car or anything by yourself. And untrue. How Marxists define pro- private property is, like he said, anything that produces values. Factories, stores, farms. We hold that these cannot be privately owned institutions because... Uh, well, a variety of reasons. It makes accumulation of wealth inevitable within a single family, usually. And this then leads to that family having far too much economic and political power, for one thing. It's a system in which corruption is inherent. Anyone, anyone want to jump on this one? <laughs> I think you hit the nail on the head. That's the main distinction. Private okay. property is anything you can accumulate, like use someone to work for. So you can accumulate wealth. Personal property is something that you use like, on a daily basis. Yeah, basically we want to prevent uh, exploitation. A group. Yeah, we want to prevent a single group gaining authoritarian power through economic and political means by making sure that the means of productions are controlled through a democratic process. And uh, the fact that socialism is inherently democratic because it requires worker control as well as public dictation of resources is something conservatives and liberals do not like to talk about because, well, they want the monopoly on democracy. They, They don't like to paint us as anything but authoritarian exactly and um they openly deny the fact that capitalism is inherently um, flawed and the fact that socialism is inherently democratic yeah that's also has to do with the cold war and all the rep- propaganda that went out through the western world from the capitalists and through their media like it pretty much confused the proletariat and they just got spread through schools and colleges and all that history uh from the 50s and whatnot needs to be redone and looked at 
Exactly. We need to look a lot more critically at it because the thing about that history is it's been colored by a capitalist lens. Um, if you, you know, look at the dialectics of it, there's no way that capitalism and capitalists would want to portray socialism and socialists in a good light. And such, they slander us through the media and through generations. And it all actually started in Nazi Germany and its fascist counterparts and such around the world, which originally began slandering the USSR. And it was picked up after World War II by the US media. In, in fact, uh, cultural Marxism, which is the right's new favorite buzzword, is a direct ad adaptation of cultural Bolshevism, which was a term coined by, I believe, Goebbels himself, Goebbels or Hitler, uh, in the Nazi propaganda machine, in order to dissuade people from activities that would be counter to their ideology. Also, it looks like uh, we're going to have our comrade Marcos joining us soon, so that should be fun. All right. So, right on to, okay, necessity of revolution. So, who wants to kick us off? I guess I could do it. Because 2008 happened and we never came back from it fully. And along with the, you can see it now with the rise of fascism in Europe and America. And how production of the workers went through the roof and the wages stayed the same and how the capitalists sent production out to third world countries. This is all like, this shows that you need a socialist revolution. The fact that people die because they can't afford a basic human right, which is healthcare, or people starve in Africa because they can't get food, because if you don't have money, you don't deserve it, et cetera, et cetera. That's very true. And the way which the media colors all this to try and make it seem as if you know, um, nothing's wrong with the system. It's just wrong with the individuals. If you look at poverty and the way which is portrayed in the West, um, people who are poor, they're not victims of the system. They're victims of their own laziness or such. And these lies that are perpetrated. Um, you know, if you're, oh, if you're unemployed, get a job, except for the fact that there's not enough jobs to go around. And that all has to do with the capitalists relying on the army of unemployment, which is, having a mass of unemployed workers so that the workers that do have jobs are in fear of losing them. So they don't bargain for better rights for that. And if they lose their pay, they don't argue with it or else they'll get fired. And if they do argue, if they do strike, you just fire them all and hire a bunch of people off the street to replace them. And this is something which, like, there's a lot of good resources that talk about this. And there was, like, we were watching a short film about it a while ago that sort of illustrated that, you know, workers are forced into poor conditions because of the, the army of unemployment. Yes, that also has to do with how capitalism just uses resources. For example, climate change destroying the environment, constantly using oil and gas, and wasting rare earth metals just so you can make a new iPhone so your business won't fail. Like, that is a problem that's literally killing our planet. We have Marcos joining us here, uh, who's a more senior member of our cadre. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, uh, I'm Marcos. I mean, I'm, you know, just a member of the MPU, and i here. <laughs> All right, uh, Marcos, would you like to give your input on, very briefly, the necessity of revolution? Sure. All so right. we see in current society, capitalist society, that there are, of course, two classes, proletarian and bourgeoisie. You know, Marx pinpointed that in you know, all of his work, so it's a basic point of Marxism. But the idea of revolution comes in when, you know, I guess there's the question, reform or revolution? You know, the very broad, very, uh, you know, broad argument. And it has to be brought up, like, which one would you prefer? Well, whichever one is more important, whichever one is more necessary. I think uh, revolution is more necessary rather than reform, uh, because I don't think that reform can work under our societies. Um, under capitalist society in particular, because the ruling classes will not give up their power, they won't give up their hegemony, 
you know, to the common people, the proletariat. Nobody wants to give up their power, which is why they wouldn't do such a thing. I mean, the system is modeled after their interests. So if the system is modeled after their interests, they're obviously not going to just let somebody else overthrow that through their own means, which is what Lenin coined as, or I don't know, coined, but mentioned as parliamentarism or uh, quote unquote democracy. Uh, I, I do want to add, like, there is, like, there was, there's one exception, and that would be Chile and Allende. He did manage to reform, like, reform, if you want to say, from the inside, but that didn't last very long. Yeah, because, what happened? Yeah. Yeah. And that was immediately followed by a CIA-backed uh, fascist coup. Perfect. And, and so, like, when, if you try, you know, it's been tried to reform the system, but more often than not, I mean, we only have one example, but generally it will cause a major right-wing response that will most likely cause a return to the norm, as we put it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd just like to add that these uh, reactionary forces are almost always backed by the international capitalist or the organizations that serve the international capitalists, such as the CIA. Mm -hmm. When we talk about the uh, topic of bourgeois democracy, Dr. Michael Perini put it very nicely when he said, um, all that the ruling classes care about when it comes to the working population is what you think, not what you do, not what you believe. It's what you think of them because they don't want their system threatened. So the point of bourgeois democracy is to make you think that you have input in the government when you really don't. It's there so that you can think you're affecting change when you vote, and it keeps you from wanting to go outside the system to affect change through revolution. Yeah, but it only shows its true colors when there's like a crisis in capitalism like what we've seen in Nazi Germany or the U.S. and uh, the business plot where there was a plan to overthrow the current government and install a fascist dictatorship. Exactly. And if you think about it, like, there's many great um, terms for fascism. Like, it, in essence, it's the purest form of capitalism. It's the monopoly form of capitalism. It's after capitalism has begun to fail, and they're desperately trying to hold on to the system by cracking down on all the things that caused the system to be inefficient from a capitalist standpoint. So that would be worker rights, um, you know, labor laws, um, labor unions, all the stuff that's meant to benefit the working class and that most people would consider would be good, like free education, public health care. They get rid of those things. The bourgeois democracy, they get rid of that because it's not suiting their needs. It transforms from a system where people are kept in place by illusion to a system where people are kept in place by force. Another ironic thing, they like to say in communist countries, they're all brainwashed or they're all getting fooled by the government's propaganda. And that's literally the exact opposite of what we see. Exactly. And if you've ever watched videos of people from communist countries talking with people from the West, they're oftentimes more and more informed and better informed than the people in the West. And it's not like if you look at people in the Soviet Union, when they go to university and that they learn a lot about the West and they read Western writers and philosophers and that and they know about it because they're educated to a higher level than those in the West. And, you know, a lot of people like to think that um, people in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea don't know what's going on outside, where if you ever go there and you talk to them, they know a lot about what's going on. And there's many of them that speak English, and they're really not as isolated as people like to make them out. Yes, they even have iPhones and computer source. And if Kim Jong-un currently, well, I think to put it in his words, he's starting a second industrial revolution, which is to make more technology and increase internet for the North Korean people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, propaganda is certainly a major obstacle to spreading of any revolution. We see great examples of the slandering of North Korea, uh, which, whether it be them believing they found a unicorn a couple of years back, that was a story that circulated around, or uh, them making it illegal to have any haircut except that of Kim Jong-un. 
I don't think there was a good movie that, it, or not a movie, but a little there interview was, yeah. on YouTube. It was called The Haircut. Well. Yeah. The, yeah. I can, yeah. I'll, I'll link it. It was a uh, documentary made by a couple friends who wanted to travel to North Korea and get a haircut there to see if they could have a proper haircut. And, of course, they got there and they got a pretty decent haircut. They And they also traveled around and talked with people. And it was all sort of to show that the DPRK isn't as bad and as isolated as the West likes to make it out to be. It was a very good um, film. And it wasn't for, like, the people who made it, they were not socialists. They were just, you know, regular people. It's uh, very ironic. Like, most of these media institutions are controlled by corporations. Like, Disney owns ABC. Uh, what is it? I think Comcast owns NBC. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I don't, I don't know for sure, but media consolidation is also a big thing that's going on. Or has been oh. on for the past several years. Speaking of Disney and indirectly, another topic I like to talk about, which is censorship, the lies about censorship in the communist countries, which we just kind of briefly touched on, how they aren't fed a lot of bullshit about the West. Whereas there were laws to prevent Western propaganda from popping up in uh, communist societies. And there were laws similar to that in the West, but we don't like to talk about that here. But one of the main ways we uh, censored ourselves was uh, naturally through uh, the capitalist system, which is movies have to adhere to a very strict policy of consumerism, which is something George Lucas talks about, where... You have to make your movies in a way that will, for instance, sell toys, that will drive uh, profits above all else. And he specifically said uh, in an interview that he knew directors, at, this was at the time when the Soviet Union was still around, he knew directors in the Soviet Union that he was friends with that had more creative freedom than he did other than a very narrow range of things, such as directly criticizing the government. On the topic of Hollywood's role in American propaganda, Dr. Mike Parenti had a really good talk on this called um, Rambo and the Swarthy Hordes, where he talked about how in the Hollywood industry and in the media industry, you have to conform to the capitalist beliefs. You can't say anything critical of the system. And there were movies that were very critical of uh, capitalism, but they never got released because there was a lot of intervention like they were not be able, they were not allowed to be played at any movie theaters if they even were released or they were like bought out and such but yeah and you had to conform to a very narrow view of the world speaking of that that reminds me of this movie that came out it was like either late last year or early this year um it was about a couple of rich indonesian people i think that's one of the things that plays into like capitalist propaganda. They promote that type of lifestyle, that bourgeois lifestyle. As you not realizing that the way they accumulate their wealth is like through people suffering, not being able to get like a good enough wage to buy a house, get food, or raise kids. And they give you that image like you could live like this one day. Everybody got that chance, but in reality, it's like five, like eight pe- richest people in the world control like. Um, have like like half of the world's wealth or yeah. something. No, they're richer than the bottom half of the world's population. Yes. And that just goes to like like proof that propaganda that is just running through it. Because one thing that um Marx talked about in I think Angles was you have the economic base and then the societal superstructure is affected by that base like capitalism you need to buy stuff or else the system is going to collapse so they promote that culture of buying stuff through ads and tv newspapers and movies as well and you could see that like if you just look at any tv show or go on go on any website or just go downtown and also can we mention um that in the original end credits for Rambo 3, it said this movie is dedicated to the brave fighters of the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, which, for those of you who might not know what the Mujahideen is, it was an umbrella term for groups such as the Taliban and ISIS, which originally were supported by the U.S. when they were overthrowing the um, the government that was backed by the USSR, the um, 
Afghanistan's socialist government. And then after the Taliban had overthrown it, the U.S. went in there to wipe out the Taliban and claim a bunch of the spoils of war. Yeah, I think they have a lot of mineral wealth, uh, mineral wealth in uh, Afghanistan, and it's yeah, severely and limited the like, freedom of people there. Like, if you look at the U.S.'s invasion of Iraq or its intervention in Syria, it's all based around resources. Um, it was for Iraqi oil originally because Saddam Hussein, who was originally put in power by the CIA, was trying to nationalize Iraqi oil fields and trying to protect the Iraqi oil market. So they intervened and because uh, they couldn't lose out on that sweet, sweet Iraqi oil. And then if you look at in Syria, the U.S. has been constructing illegal military bases in Syrian territory right next to the oil fields. Well, we'll have a special... Probably few episodes dedicated to uh, America. Amer- good old American intervention. It's yeah, it's a it's a common um, rhetoric, especially like in the West. It's we're fighting communism for democracy or freedom, which I remember in middle school and high school. I don't know about you guys, but that was mainly what I was taught. It was democracy versus communism in the Cold War. Yeah, it's not capitalism versus socialism. It's democracy. I was taught that as well. Like, it was exactly. like first and second grade. They teach you that, like, real early. The teachers tell you that we're going to war so we can bring people freedom. And, like, and, you know, no one ever questions these things because it's like the school would never lie to me. Why would, why would, like, what motives would the school have to lie about exactly. those things? And if you look at, if you look at how indoctrination is carried out in the West, it's a lot more subtle. It's not like they got po- posters up everywhere saying, obey your capitalist leaders, you know, worship the government. It's not stuff like that. It's always a lot more subtle. They like to think that you have choice. They like to think that um, you're given the truth when really it's just a bunch of lies. They give you a bunch of different sources to choose from. There's like a dozen different news channels, but they all have the same shit on them. And if you, like, look... In the school system, they don't give you an alternate perspective that you you won't find in any you know history textbook in North America. Stuff saying how you know poverty was completely eliminated in the USSR and Cuba and essentially every socialist state. As well, uh, they won't tell you that a lot of labor movements were started by communists in the U.S. And, yeah. and they don't like to talk about working conditions before those labor movements in the vast majority of cases. Exactly. And if we talk about labor movements, we have to mention the great income inequality between um, the first world and the third world. Oh, and, yes. you know, Dr. Michael Parenti, who, you know, I he's a very, very uh, good political scientist and lecturer, and he's talked about how... How exactly in the West do we explain that we make living wage, um, you know, and we have such great working conditions, while those in third world countries, you know, work in sweatshops for 23 hours a day? How do we explain this? You know, it's not because the people in third world countries are lazier than us or they're not as good at getting well-paying jobs. It's because of the successful labor movements in North America and the first world that has won us these great things. They've won us labor laws. They've won they, us, um, you know, overtime pay and such. And we wouldn't argument. have this without the labor movements that were led by socialists. That's another thing to mention is that in the United States, people like to claim that the uh, economy is just a mix of capitalist and socialist policies. And that's what the way it is. And I've heard so often that people say, hey, look, if it was true capitalism, you know, if we were completely capitalist, it wouldn't be this way. It'd be much better. If you want to see true capitalism, look at Asia. Look at Latin America, you know, look at Africa, look at those impoverished countries and see that what the labor movements didn't bring to them, what they brought to the U.S. See, the whole labor movement in the United States brought, you know, eight hour workdays, uh, regulation of businesses and corporations and um, all kinds of labor laws that were enacted because of those great people. But, you know, without them, where would the working class be today? What would it be like if those labor movements weren't around, if they didn't exist? Uh, I can give you some hints. I worked at a non-union factory doing 12-hour night shifts, and it's not fun. And I acknowledge that even those conditions were much better than the ones in third world factories. But it was still, hey, 
if there's a suggestion box, but if you use the suggestion box, you might get fired for being a few minutes late the next couple days. Also, that leads me to another point of what Kobe Mark said. Um, this plays into fascist ideology. What they see is like, what they don't understand is that capital needs, uh, in order to get wealth in these rich capitalist nations like the US, um, Britain, and France, they need to exploit the labor of third world countries, and that's why jobs often leave to go there. And then this plays into their ideology and leads them to say that, oh, the people in Africa, sub Saharan Africa, never got anything done just because of genetics or they're stupid or they're uh, inferior. When in actuality, um, the people in sub Saharan sub Saharan Africa had civilizations just as good as like Egypt or um, the ones in Europe. One thing we haven't touched on yet is dialectical materialism, which is humanity's ideas are shaped by our environment. Without material conditions, uh, material conditions are what shape our thoughts. For instance, we wouldn't have any concept of flight in a world without birds or avian creatures. A fish has no concept of breathing in the same way that scorpion in the desert has no concept of the ocean. Our material world is what creates our societies, our, what defines our thought processes. And, and so when you see the development of civilizations and inventions, liberals and conservatives will instantly point to uh, the great men of the era, era or, uh, oh, they just happened to get society right without acknowledging the material conditions required to do so. So Europeans, for instance, had a very fantastic climate in which to build civilization. They had an abundance of resources. They didn't have a climate where they say had to be constantly fighting over water, such as in desert climates. They, in Western Europe, they didn't have to uh, constantly worry about having to go raid other settlements for food, for the most part, because they had the climate most of the year to uh, grow their own food, which is, mm -hmm. and in the inverse of that, the whole reason that the Vikings uh, or the Nordic peoples be, uh, had Vikings was because they needed to raid other places for resources that they did not themselves have, mostly slaves uh, to help grow crops uh, and a variety of other resources. Society develops by necessity in the vast majority of cases, uh, and it's based on material conditions. Exactly. And we need to talk about the relation of material conditions to the mode of production and the different ages of history. There are, you know, uh, different ages of society. And um, as material conditions develop, the uh, um, social conditions will develop and the relationships to the mode of production will, will develop. And, um, for example, in... Um, primitive days, most society was just a small communes of um, tribes people that shared what they had, which is sometimes referred to as primitive communism. But as things developed and um, people began to gather in larger groups and conflict came into play, they developed into slave society, where people would enslave others to get more work done and such, which was the first step towards a capitalist society. But in between slave society and capitalist society, we have feudal society, where people went from directly owning the slaves to owning the land and the mode of production that the slaves use. So instead, they technically had some freedom as serfs in the feudal society, but they were not free to go out and, you know, start farming in common land. You know, um, there were people who tried that that were called the diggers, and they tried to till unowned land, but the um, landlords and such nearby came and drove them off and killed them. Yeah, uh, also, hunter-gatherers are often the happiest people in the world. It's because they don't have to deal with the hardships of, like, class struggle, always having to worry about, like, when they get food or what the local landlord is going to think 
or um, if he break this law, what would happen? How would the community think of him? And um, to my last point, which came back to me now, a lot of people like to point to Korea and Japan, South Korea and Japan, as examples of great capitalist nations. But the thing is, the more advanced capitalism is, the more alien the society is. So, for example, in South Korea, kids have to work. Kids have to go to school longer than they have in the U.S. Like, they go to this thing called, like, Yokbang, which is, like, after school study session, they could stay there for hours on end. So they're often suicidal. And they're elderly. Um, because they didn't have, like, a social security system, so you could, like, give, put in money into the society and get it back. Like, South Korean government just doesn't care about the uh, senior citizens. So many of them are drawn into poverty and prostitution. And a lot of people in South Korea have, like, the highest... Well, South Korea itself has the highest uh, alcoholism in, like, any country because of the pressures from work and having to worry about paying your bills on time and the highest um, housing prices. It even got so bad, like, in Japan, where they have, like, the same issues, they had to make free government housing because people just couldn't afford to live on their own. And and because it's, like, right next to North Korea, it shows a stark contrast of what a capitalist society and what a socialist society would be like. Mm-hmm. Look at a lot of the North Korean defectors who have fled to South Korea. A surprising um, amount of them want to return to North Korea after living in South Korea for some time. Because a lot of the people in socialist countries don't realize how good they have it compared to capitalist countries. Because they have guaranteed education at a higher quality than that found in any public education system outside of a socialist country. They have free health care. They have 100% free, um, you know, university and post-secondary education, and they can get a job. They're guaranteed a job in their field after they finish university, as well as a guaranteed housing. There's really nothing they have to worry about. And the thing is, this had to do with the fall of the USSR, is that they allowed so much American propaganda through that the people began to believe that capitalism was a land of plenty where everyone, you know, owned fast cars and mansions and such, but... They didn't realize what would happen because if you look at the current former socialist states, they're all, almost all are um, massive hubs of poverty. And polls show that majority of those people in those former states want communism back. Like Romania, I think it's eighty percent, and in Russia, it's like sixty percent. And- Stalin is—he's like—he's one of the most. He's one of the most praised figures in Russia, in modern-day Russia, like, even more so than Putin. Really? All those polls, they have to do with, if you look at the different generations of people, the people who lived under socialism, over 80% of them want socialism back. And even the people um, who didn't live under socialism, around, like, 50 to 60% of them want socialism. They want communism because they know how it was under the USSR, and they prefer it to how it is in modern-day Russia. And I have friends who live in Russia and people who have lived in the Soviet Union and that. And they talk, you know, um, everything was guaranteed there. There, Nobody feared for their future in the Soviet Union because they knew that their children would be cared for by the system. They would be cared for by the system. And they could live happy lives. And that's not something which we can almost – we can't even really comprehend that in a, in a capitalist system. Yeah. One of the things, I don't know what it was or where it was, but I had heard somewhere that there was um, someone from the Soviet Union was talking about uh, just something as simple as butter. You know, um, in the USSR, there was one, uh, I guess, brand, if you want to call it, of butter. Right. And it was it was decent. It was all right. But now that capitalism has been instituted in Russia, you know, it's been around for, you know, 20, 30 odd years. Uh, there are multiple companies that own the butter, and it's driven the quality of the butter down to, you know, kind of shitty levels. Whereas before, there was a set uh, sort of quality for the butter produced by the state. So I mean, the, I mean, just something as simple as butter can be like twisted and made to less quality than it was. I mean, that's why people feel so nostalgic about the USSR because there were, uh, you know, definite qualities that had to be ensured so that the people got what was 
you know, decent. It's not based off of profit. It was based off of what's good and what's necessary and what's viable for society. I mean, like, when the Soviet Union fell, it wasn't just, like, all the Russians rejoiced and were like, yay, hooray. No, most of the common people, they were, they suffered more entire villages and cities. They fell because they weren't profitable. And, like, there was even a uh, a, a, coup, a coup attempted to replace, uh, to, to rebel against Yeltsin. Even animals suffered after the USSR collapsed, like the Siberian tiger. Before, in the, in the Soviet days, you didn't need to go, like, hunt tiger skin and sell it to the Chinese, because you all your basic needs were met. You could just live your normal life. But after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, the Siberian tiger's numbers drastically went down, because it was the only people's, like, mean of subsistence. And, like, that's the next thing with poaching. Like, people do poaching not because, like, they hate animals or because they're evil. Because they're, like, they need that money so they won't starve and die. The thing is, under socialism, people didn't have to worry. But now that socialism is gone, uh, most of the people in former socialist states have either, you know, um, turned to socialism or they've turned to fascism. And that was one of the things that led to the overthrow of a lot of the uh, socialist governments in the Eastern Bloc, which was the rise of fascism that was sponsored by the U.S. and the West. Mm-hmm. And if you look at like a lot of the countries um, that are former socialist states, they are almost fascist, if not completely. If you look at um, Ukraine, they have immortalized a bunch of um, SS um, volunteers and stuff who um, executed Jews in that Ukraine and massacred Poles as their national heroes. Same as Estonia and Latvia. Yes, yeah, of course. Same in the U.S. It's like... There's a lot of fascists starting to rise, uh, especially down south. And it's pretty bad because it's like a tactic that the bourgeoisie use against you. It's not uh, the falling rate of profit or us cutting your wages so our business won't fail. It's the Mexicans, it's the Arabs, it's the blacks, it's the Jews, etc. I mean, going back to the whole, like, you know, thing, like, in these post-socialist uh, states, it's either communism or fascism. Like East Germany, for example, majority of people from East Germany, they're either a they're nostalgic for the East, Ger- like the DDR, and to get that back, or they're just Nazis. Yeah, and and keep in mind, this is the one of the best capitalist countries in the world is Germany. They are the strongest economy in Europe, and <laughs> and still, most of the former East Germans want a return to socialism. And this just goes to show, like, in the U.S., they say, look at our wealth. We're accumulating so much. Our um, stocks are straight through the roof. But the thing about that, it doesn't show, like, how the average person lives. The commoner doesn't live extravagant lives. Stocks are a very – the stock market is a very dishonest way of uh, evaluating the economy. It it literally only applies to the wealth of the rich. Stocks are not a reflection of how the common people are doing. Exactly. And if you look at how they measure poverty, it often leaves a lot of people. Because, you know, if you look at um, the statistics for poverty in the U.S., they're overwhelming. But the thing is, is a lot of those statistics have been doctored up to make them look a lot more um, pleasing. You know, they're a lot more conservative estimates. Um, The thing is, is like they'll say, you know, um, they have like a 20% or so um, poverty rate, yet in reality, their poverty rate might be closer to 30% if you evaluate, you know, your definition of poverty. Um, because there's a lot of people in the U.S. who can't afford um, both housing and food, and they have to choose between the two. They may have a job, but they can't afford, you know, they, they, most of their money either goes into their rent or to their food. And that's why a lot of people, you know, rely on food banks and such in both the U.S. and in my country, Canada. And this shows, like, the inherent contradictions with capital. Like, pe- people, um, a lot of capitalists say Marx was wrong because the system hasn't collapsed when they said it was. But the thing is, the capitalists will always try to find a way to save themselves. Great, like, after the 1970s, I'm pretty sure there was a crisis that was happening. And so what they did was load people um, 
on debt. They use debt to save themselves. Then they have the IMF and World Bank load third world countries on debt so they could make more profit. Now we're starting to see that it's starting to fail. Like that debt tactic is not working anymore. And we're starting to like the signs are showing like a new crisis is about to come on. And now they're starting to pro, pro, uh, propose a UBI, universal basic income. So, and this would make it worse. So it's like, they would say, we already give you money. So why do you want higher wages? Why do you want lower healthcare costs? Stop being lazy and stop wasting your money. It would just be another tactic. Um, Not to mention it would just drive up inflation. That as well. It would just be another tactic uh, to make the people suffer. And a lot of liberals um, who call themselves the left, well, in my country, the U.S., don't see that problem. Debt credit IOUs, they're all like a tool created by the capitalist class to give the lower classes a sense, an illusion of uh, wealth. Mm -hmm. Kind of creates a false consciousness uh, sense. In terms of false consciousness, one very effective top uh tactic in the US that the bourgeois have used is to try to subdivide the working class into say the lower class, uh the middle class, the upper middle class, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. There is two material classes, the workers and the capitalists. And then you could those are the only two definitive classes that you can distinguish based on material wealth, based on material conditions. Any further actions to subdivide those classes is only an attempt to weaken the power of the working class. So in America, there's like five classes, the underclass, the working class, the lower middle class, and the upper middle class. Would you classify the lower middle class, which I think is the class of professionals as part of the middle class or the working class well this this is the point that it's meaningless rhetoric it, exactly it doesn't mean and, anything and the thing is is the middle class is pretty much split between the workers and the petty bourgeoisie and they're lumped together to try and blur the lines between the two and you know, if you look at what would be considered middle class, there's a lot of the people who, you know, actually like own small businesses and that, which would be considered petty bourgeoisie. Um, and the thing is, proletariats are the people who are working for wages at businesses that are owned by other people. And that's really the only way to classify it. And then there's, of course, the lumpen proletariat that are the people who are either unemployed or such or employed, employed illegally. Another question uh, regarding, like, Okay, you got like the small bourgeoisie and the larger bourgeoisie, like the corporations. Would you say like they have the same interests altogether? No. I would no. say, I, I would say that the petite bourgeois, they're not really like they're not thinking all deviously like, oh, how can I get the most profit out of this person? I would, I'm assuming that they're more of people just trying to get by with the system. They're just like, well, other people are doing it, so I mean, I, this is how they make a living. Like that, they they're just. They're just interested in surviving in this world, and maybe business is the only thing that they think can, uh, can help them get through this world. I know, but the thing about the petty bourgeoisie is a lot of them were, were like born into money. If you look at like the vast majority of the petty bourgeoisie, they're people who might not necessarily own large corporations, but perhaps their parents did, and they have the money which they've inherited, or they've inherited a lot of land and such, and they don't work for their money but they don't necessarily exploit masses of other people. They might, you know, still have small businesses and such. But um, really, um, as Michael Parenti put it, when we're dealing with small businesses, they are sort of the squirrels dancing with the elephants. Um, they really don't have much impact on the system because they are relatively powerless compared to the large bourgeoisie and the, you know, the greater corporations. And about the fascists, like... Speaking of false consciousness, this is one thing that's been going on. So I have a question for y'all. What, what is an effective tactic to stop them? Like, what would you do in order to slow the rise of fascism and, like, promote communism? How we address fascism, it can differ between country to country due to the fact, uh, 
you know, each there there are different material conditions, and there's a different like different groups using like they use similar tactics, but I think it all comes down to the country's conditions and how to effectively deal with their rise of fascism, because like the rise of fascism in Ukraine, for instance, isn't the same as the rise of fascism in America or Germany. But the, I I think end of the day the best way to argue against fascism is to simply break it down because a lot of fascists are either lumped in proletariat, which is not workers, but usually the criminals or the extremely poor. I would disagree. I wouldn't say that the largest portion of them are lumped in proletariat. Um, They sort of want you to think, but if you look at like the people who are actually fascists, they are coming from a petty bourgeoisie Um, standpoint, and that they gain um, sort of traction with some of the lower, more disenfranchised people, which would be the lumpen proletariat. And that's just simply because those people are so desperate, they're looking for an idea to latch on to, some sort of hope. And it's the, they are being manipulated by the petty bourgeoisie and the bourgeoisie at large. But if you look at the people who are like the fascist leaders and the people who are indeed like the major fascists, those are petty bourgeoisie and bourgeoisie. Yeah, that's what I was going to uh, say, that the love and proletariat generally make up a large portion of their base, but their leadership is almost entirely uh, bourgeois of some sort, usually petite bourgeois. The really simple way of looking at it is that fascism is a very simple ideology. It doesn't have any nuance. It's not complicated. It's uh, we're not going to change, we're not going to inherently change the system. All classes, all people of a nation are going to collaborate against a common foe, towards a common goal. It's easy to pitch, and the arguments of fascism are generally uh, not made on an economic level. They're made on a uh, emotional. Fascism is very emotional uh, ideology. It's not exactly. based on the re- on reality. It's based on pure populism without actually addressing any issues. Yeah. Uh, we and a very disturbing trend that I can reflect on now is that he, it's taught in schools that the fascists, especially the Nazi Germany and Hitler, were great. Were great economists that they built Germany almost out of nothing after the World War One, which is nonsense. They actually started to ruin the German economy through their policy, uh, and the German economy was getting to be very solid at when the Nazis over. The uh, great instance of this is the Autobahn, which was touted as a Nazi achievement, even though it was started under the Weimar Republic, and uh, funding towards constructing it was drastically decreased by the Nazis because, well, they were extremely anti-social programs or any the government constructing everything. They wanted everything to be in the hands of uh, businesses, maybe more so, more or less directed by the national government, uh, if you look at the history of the Nazis, it's much more a case of the business owners collaborating for their own interest with the German government to ensure their own future than the Nazi government dictating what the business owners do. They had essentially free reign, and there were actually many cases of German companies uh, illegally trading with the Allies. Of course, and also not to mention Allied companies illegally trading with Nazi Germany. For example, the Ford Company is a major one. If you look at um, Henry Ford himself, he was an outspoken fascist, and he had actually received an award from Adolf Hitler himself, and they were considered personal friends. And if you look at the Ford factories that were in Nazi Germany during the war... 
they were operating, um, serving the Nazis and building armaments for the Nazis. And the thing was, is American and British um, bombs weren't allowed to touch those factories because they were Ford factories. And for everyone that got destroyed by the Brits, um, the Brits had to pay Ford um, reparations for destroying their factories, which is kind of funny. But And um, the German civilians actually took cover in those factories because they knew it wouldn't be bombed by the uh, Allies. Yeah. Um, fascism is essentially the idea of creating a society based on uh, collectivism without, uh, while keeping its very divisive uh super the very divisive superstructure that is uh capitalism capitalism is inherently self-dividing to a people yeah and i wouldn't even call fascism collectivist i would say like if you look at fascism it's always it's always about how like it's how the the individual can serve the state and not how the state can serve the individual it's it's simply all sort of a disguise over um, capitalism becoming increasingly authoritarian as it decays. Yeah, it, it's, and it's really it's about as collectivist as capitalism is, and you know it doesn't become increasingly feedback. collectivist, but they want you to think it is. They want you to think that you're part of a greater whole, and you know by serving your great fascist overlords, you're you know improving society when really you're not. The big part of the fascist rhetoric is like it's blaming other people for their issues and it's really easy to push the blame on other people because it's like oh they're the outsiders they're the issue when more often than not it's an internal issue speaking of issues uh, a lot of people like to tell out automation as an issue but the thing is I'm pretty sure the capitalists won't use automation I know they're sort short sighted by it like with automation, yes, that will cut your costs, but you still need workers in order to buy stuff, in order for the system to function. It would be super detrimental for them in the long run to use automation. And that's a problem with capitalism. It's not based on rational planning. It's based on everyone looking out for their own self-interest. So when more and more companies start to use automation to cut costs, they'll be laying off more and more workers, which means these same companies and other companies will have uh, less customers because less people will be able to afford their products. Exactly. And it's very much a snowball effect. Then and the thing yeah. about automation is, it, as they lay off people, it increases the army of unemployment and makes the unemployed more desperate for a job. So what happens is, um, at one point, um, cheap labor becomes even cheaper than automation. So we are sort of reset to the early days of capitalism, where people work for like a dollar a day or less in a sweatshop for you know twenty three hours a day or something. And that's because that's the um, uh, about the only rate which they would be more effective and cheaper than uh, automation. And it sort of brings capitalism full circle through automation. If we look at um, how automation would be used in the socialist system, it would be used to benefit the whole as um, automation replaces workers, but the workers don't go into unemployment. They go into um, whatever they want to do. They can, you know, learn new talents. They can go back to school and increase their knowledge and education because the state cares for them. And the money that, and like, or sorry, I shouldn't use the term money, but the resources that are generated from the automation are used to improve their lives instead of being hoarded by a small few. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For uh, now, uh, Ben, the voice of the people's unity. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.